Hi everybody, so we're continuing on our urinary system lecture with the ureters. So I just wanted to show you this diagram as the second slide or first slide from our PowerPoint presentation that we started during our first lecture on the urinary system. And I just wanted to repoint out to you where the ureters are. So these are the kidneys, right? So as you probably know by now, the ureters are these uh, muscular tubes, and by muscular we mean they're lined by smooth muscle, that are there to convey the urine from the kidneys all the way down to the urinary bladder. So here we have the urinary bladder where we have the temporary storage of urine, and then here we have the ureters. And just like the kidneys, the ureters lay behind the posterior wall of the abdominal pelvic cavity. Now remember, the outer boundaries of the abdominal pelvic cavity are lined by parietal peritoneum, right? That serous membrane that we talked about before. So the whole back of the abdominal pelvic cavity is lined by this parietal peritoneum, and the kidneys and the ureters sit behind this serous curtain wall, so to say, in the retroperitoneal space. So now that we've uh, pointed out these anatomical structures to you, I want to go back to our OneDrive, and we're going to go back to the packet. We want to go to the packet. Um, here we go. All right, so here we go. Okay, so... Ureters are retroperitoneal like the kidneys. Oh, i got to turn on my little stylus here. So the ureters are retroperitoneal like the kidneys. Their job is to transport urine from the kidney to the urinary bladder. Uh, they are about 10 to 12 inches long, so about a foot, translated into metric units, metric units, that's 25 to 30 centimeters. Uh, they are ultimately really just extensions from the renal pelvis. So just as a recap, you know that the urine is coming out of the uh, thousands and thousands of microscopic collecting ducts at the tips of the renal pyramids, which are the renal papillae. And then the urine empties out into the minor calyces, and then the minor calyces empty the urine into, two, into the two to three major calyces, and then those two to three major calyces empty the urine into that funnel-shaped tube called the renal pelvis, and then the renal pelvis directly uh, takes the urine to the ureter, and that's happening in both kidneys. So then the ureters connect with the bladder at the bottom of the bladder, which is called the base. So it's at the base of the bladder that um, the two ureters are connecting and conveying the urine ultimately for storage in the urinary bladder. So now let's talk about the urinary bladder. So the urinary bladder is a hollow muscular organ located behind the pubic symphysis. By muscular, we mean that it's also lined by smooth muscle like the ureters. So it's behind the pubic symphysis. You guys remember what the pubic symphysis is, right? It's that uh, uh, grouping of elastic cartilage that's between your two pubic bones of your ox coxae, that is your hip bones, right? So pubic symphysis. Function is to store urine temporarily. Located in the pelvic cavity, The inner lining, or epithelium, is defined histologically as transitional epithelium. Now, with transitional epithelium, you have all the three major types of cells that you see in epithelial tissue. So remember, you can break down the cells that you see in epithelial tissue according to three different morphological types. There's squamous-shaped cells, there's cuboidal-shaped cells, and then there's columnar-shaped cells. Within transitional, you see the full spectrum of uh, cuboidal, squamous, and columnar shaped cells with everything in between. Now, even more interesting is that as the bladder stretches, which the bladder is designed to do, the epithelial cells change as well. Their shapes actually change with the stretching of this um, 
uh, organ. And so the actual uh, variations in the shapes of the cells are there to help facilitate this stretching of this epithelium along with the entire organ as a whole. So what happens is, I'm, maybe I'm not doing a very good job at describing to you what this looks like or, or why it's the way it is, but imagine this. If you have a whole bunch of little cuboidal shaped and columnar shaped cells, as you stretch them out, what are they going to become? They're going to become more squamous, and that's what happens is these cells, as they have tensile forces applied to them, stretch out, and they become more oblong the more stress that they encounter, all right? So they're designed, so to say, to be able to withstand these tensile forces uh, that occur here at this location. So this transitional epithelium is also known as, and really the and should be replaced with or, urothelium. So urothelium is the same thing as this transitional epithelium. All right. So the trigone is a smooth triangular region that you see um, within the inner lining of the bladder. Uh, it's located at the base of the bladder, and it outlines the locations of where you have the openings of the ureters, but also the opening of the urethra. So remember, ultimately, the urethra is going to convey rather urine away from the urinary bladder, ultimately to the outside of the body. So at this junction where you see the ureters connecting with the urinary bladder and the urethra connecting with the urinary bladder, that's where you have this triangular region um, within the inner lining of the base of the urinary bladder. So again, let me write this out and I'll show you um, a little PowerPoint presentation that I made just for this video where the trigone of the bladder is. So again, smooth, triangular, region upon the inner lining of the base of the urinary bladder outlined by oops The opening of the ureters and urethra. It's an R right here. Okay. And then the linings of the urinary bladder can be split into three distinct layers. We talked about the innermost layer, that's the epithelium. So this is the transitional epithelium that we talked about already. transitional epithelium. And then the middle layer is composed of smooth muscle, just like the ureters. And when this smooth muscle contracts, this applies force on the urine stored within the urinary bladder, and that helps express that urine through the urethra and ultimately out of the body. So this smooth muscle as a whole has a name. It's also called the detrusor muscle. Detrusor muscle. D-E-T-R-U-S. This is an S. Muscle. And then the outermost layer can be fibrous adventitia. We're just talking about loose connective tissue, right? Loose fibrous connective tissue, like areolar connective tissue. Or... The very top of the bladder is actually lined by peritoneum, more specifically parietal peritoneum. That's the serous membrane that lines the outer boundaries of your abdominal pelvic cavity. So, or peritoneum. All right, so now let's go back to our PowerPoint presentation. All right, so here we go. So I'm going to focus in on this bladder right here, and we'll do some more outlining here. So first what I'm going to do is I'm going to outline this inner layer. This is the urothelium or transitional epithelium lining 
the interior of the urinary bladder. By the way, this is like a frontal section of the urinary bladder. So we're looking at a frontal section of the urinary bladder from uh, the perspective of the front of the body, the anterior aspect of the body. Then we have this middle layer, which is composed of the detrusor muscle. I think I'll choose orange here. To you know what? I, you know I'll do the highlighter. That's a little bit more efficient with our time here. I think unless you know what I forgot. But once you zoom in. You can't erase. That's, let's just do, I'll just do the highlighter for the rest of it. Yeah, that's exactly what I want. All right, so a little bit of it will be orange, but most of it will be fuchsia. All right. So again, all of this is our detrusor muscle. And then the outer layer, I'm going to go back to one of the pen colors for this. Let's do blue, this is going to be this adventitia, this layer of loose connective tissue. Just helps bind the bladder to other surrounding muscles of like the muscles of the urogenital diaphragm, which is the muscular floor of the pelvic cavity, etc. And then here at the superior aspect of the bladder, we can see parietal peritoneum. So I think I will use orange for this. So here is this layer of parietal peritoneum, which is lying the floor of the pelvic cavity. All right, so all of this right here is all parietal peritoneum. It's all serous membrane here. And then looking inside of the bladder, namely at the base of the bladder, which is the inferior aspect of the bladder, and by the way, at the very inferior most part of the bladder, where the base of the bladder tapers, we call that the neck of the bladder, by the way, which when I zoom out, you'll be able to see the neck of the bladder um, highlighted. Let me just highlight it for you right now. So this region right here, all right, is called the neck of the bladder, FYI. Okay, so that just got rid of all those markings, which is fine by me, because I want to outline the trigone for you right now. Okay, so this is the trigone area. These are the openings of your ureters right here. And then this is the opening of the urethra. So this triangular region here between these three openings is known as the trigone. The clinical significance of the trigone is that this is the area where bladder cancer is far more likely to arise from. And that's because of the currents of the urine are going to be much more pronounced here. And so, you know, there's a lot of metabolites of drugs and other stuff that we ingest into our bodies that may be toxic to us. And so this tissue gets bombarded with all of that stuff in our urine constantly and ultimately, uh, or at least it is hypothesized, that's the, the origin of bladder cancer. And that's why bladder cancer is more likely to occur in this region. So when the urologist does a cystoscopy, right, when they take the little camera and look up into the urinary bladder through the urethra, this is the area that they're most interested in looking at. Okay, so I think I'm going to go back to the PowerPoint. Um, well, you know, before we go back to the PowerPoint, let me point out the sphincters that we're going to be talking about first. That might be easier so you can visualize it first. So in aqua right here, I'm going to highlight the internal urethral sphincter here for you. So surrounding the beginning of the urethra within the urinary bladder, we have this ring of smooth muscle which helps squeeze that opening of the urethra shut to prevent urine from coming out. However, subconsciously, when we're ready to void, right, that is to urinate, this loosens up to start allowing the urine to go down into the urethra. Right, so that's the first part of the process of urination or micturation, which is the more fancy clinical term for it. Then what happens is, is we also have um, an external urethral sphincter. And that external urethral sphincter 
is going to be a little bit more distal to the internal urethral sphincter. It's going to be a little bit closer to the opening of the urethra to the outside of the body, which is called the external urethral orifice, sometimes also known as the external urethral meatus. So I'm going to point that out to you right now. It's a little bit bigger. It's like a big donut of smooth muscle. And I think we'll do the, let's do this coral color highlight, see what this looks like. Yeah. Oh, actually, it looks more like a cherry red, doesn't it? So imagine that this is really in 3D, like a big donut surrounding this uh, more distal part of the urethra. All right. So this is the uh, sphincter that we actually have conscious control over. So when we consciously decide this is the moment where we're going to void, this is the sphincter that opens up and lets that urine um, out through the rest of the urethra and out ultimately through the external urethral orifice or the external urethral meatus. All right. So I think we'll exit out of here and we'll discard those annotations. And now we're going to go back to our OneDrive and we'll go back to the packet. All right, so these are the sphincters that I just gave reference to. So again, the internal urethral sphincter located around the opening of the urethra, uh, that is the opening of the urethra from the perspective of the bladder. This involuntary sphincter is controlled by the autonomic nervous system. Uh, this keeps the urethra closed when urine is not being passed and prevents leaking. So if you have a problem with leaking of urine, sometimes known as dribbling, then this could be the source of it. All right, so the external urethral sphincter, uh, located about two centimeters below the internal urethral sphincter, surrounds the urethra as it passes through the urogenital diaphragm. The urogenital diaphragm, by the way, is just the muscular uh, floor of the pelvic cavity. Uh, this sphincter is formed by skeletal muscle. That is important to emphasize. This is not smooth muscle because, remember, we don't have conscious control over smooth muscle, right? So it must be skeletal muscle. This is the only muscle type of our three muscle types. Remember, from AP1, we have skeletal muscle, cardiac muscle, and smooth muscle, right? So the only type of muscle that we have uh, conscious control over is skeletal muscle. So this must be skeletal muscle. And this is under, as we said before, conscious control. And then micturation, like I said before, is the process of, yeah, that's, what am I doing here? Urination. There we go. Success. Okay. So the urethra, I already talked about the urethra a little bit when we talked about the different sphincters. Um, the length of and function of the urethra, that is, differs between the two sexes, between males and females, that is. So I think you know that the urethra is much longer in males. And in males, it's actually both part of the urinary and reproductive systems. Because in the males, the, urine, or rather the uh, urethra is not only carrying urine, but it's also carrying the ejaculate. So uh, the urethra actually passes through the male's prostate gland and through the penis, the copulatory organ in the male. So uh, its function then is to transport both urine and semen or the ejaculate, whereas in females, this organ only transports urine. So it extends from the base, more specifically the neck of the urinary bladder to the outside of the body, like we pointed out to you before, and then ultimately ends in the urethral orifice. This is the opening of the urethra to the outside of the body. As I said before, also, the urethral orifice or the external urethral orifice is sometimes referred to as the external urethral meatus. Uh, urinary tract infections are more common in females. Uh, especially in the elderly. And the reason for this is the urethra is shorter in females and closer to the anus. So you, it's easier for fecal bacteria from the anus 
to reach the urethra. And this is why 40% of, of women get uh, UTIs, much higher percentage than in males. And this is a big issue with the elderly population, especially, um, is improper wiping technique, right? So you want, always want to be wiping from um, uh, back to front rather than the opposite way, because if you wipe in the opposite way, then you're more likely to uh, push that fecal bacteria um, up into the urethra. Did I just mix that up? I, I'm, I'm thinking about a ah, <laughs> little bit of um, directional confusion there. So yeah, so you're going to want to always wipe from the front to the back, as opposed to wiping from the back to the front. Because if you wipe from the back to the front, then you're going to be pushing that fecal material up towards the urethra. All right, so, and then by the way, we just have an example of a urinalysis here. Um, you don't have to memorize this by any means. Um, this is just kind of giving you an idea of, of what a, a basic urinalysis panel, panel that is, is going to look like um, in a clinical setting. But, but again, as far as, you know, taking in these numbers and memorizing them, you'll never have to do that. Um, if something is abnormal, then, uh, that data, those results will be flagged automatically for you. And over time, you're just going to kind of get a gut feeling for what these numbers really represent just by seeing lots and lots of urinalysis panels. Okay, so I think that's all we want to go over as far as the handout. Um, I did want to go over the rest of the PowerPoint slide and just show you what we mean when we say that the urethra um, in the males as part of the reproductive system as well. So here is a urinary bladder in a male. Start from the current slide. Urinary bladder in a male. So I'm going to emphasize this for you right now. So this is the urinary bladder. And in this diagram, they kind of splayed it open anteriorly so that you can see inside. Here's the trigone. This is the opening of the two ureters. And then here is the opening of the urethra. So right here in this region, this is going to be where we have our internal urethral sphincter, right? Then the urethra passes through the prostate gland. Sorry, this guy. There we go. Sorry, this is moving around. I'm trying to access the pen tool up here. Not the recording panel. Hopefully it still keeps recording. So here we have the prostate gland. And you can see that the urethra just continues to travel right through the prostate gland. Prostate gland's about the size of a walnut, by the way. And by the way, it's within the prostate gland that you have the openings of your ejaculatory ducts, which ultimately are going to be carrying the ejaculate that originated um, both from your testes and your uh, seminiferous, um, or I'm sorry, seminal vesicles, rather. So we'll talk more about that when we talk about the male reproductive system. So I don't know if they have them. No, you can't really see them. But, but right here and right here is where you have the openings of your two ejaculatory ducts taking the ejaculate into the urethra. So here the urethra passes through the urogenital diaphragm. This is just the muscular floor at the bottom of the pelvic cavity. And then continues on through the penis. So this structure right here is the penis. This is the penile urethra, the part of the urethra that's traveling through the penis. And then ultimately here, at the very end of the penis, we have our external urethral orifice. All right, again, we're going to go over all these structures again when we cover male reproductive anatomy. And then in the female, by the way, you don't have a prostate, obviously, and uh, the distance uh, that the urethra passes through is going to be much shorter because in the female, you don't have all this to get through. The external urethral orifice is going to be right about there, just a little bit more superficial to that urogenital diaphragm. All right, so that's it for the urinary system, and I'm going to get started on the female reproductive system, and I will see you soon.